Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, everyone, uh, for joining our uh, webinar uh, this evening. So I will give uh, an overview of Northern Ireland Water's asset management and also wastewater strategy team, and also a look at some of the wastewater challenges, big challenges that we have going into the future. Orla will then look at some of the examples that the wastewater, uh, wastewater strategy team are looking into. And then Andrew will finish with a program focus on IEMs, that's Integrated Environmental uh, Modeling. Okay, next slide. And maybe just before we just go into the, uh, the structure of the, the team, um, in October of 2020, Northern Ireland Water launched its 21 to 2021 to 2045 draft strategy. And this highlighted significant investment requirements in our wastewater infrastructure, uh, existing needs, and also future challenges. We have now in, uh, commenced in April of this year, PC21, which is our latest business plan, which runs from 2021 to 2027. And again, there is big wastewater challenges within that program. And uh, we will talk about that there in a wee bit more detail in this presentation. And then I'm sure many of the audience will be aware on the 5th of October at Stormont then had a debate entitled Crisis in Wastewater and Sewage Capacity. And again, highlighting the need for significant investment in our wastewater infrastructure. So the objective of tonight's presentation is to outline Northern Ireland Water's wastewater strategy team and how that team is developing to meet the challenges of wastewater going into the future. So what do we see just if I can get myself right here. So the, the team then, uh, just looking at asset management, we have got asset management, which is led by uh, Barry Ney, and then we've got a number of people then who work uh, to Barry. So we've got investment management and we've got water strategy and then we've got myself under wastewater strategy and then we've got a post for asset information which will be uh, that post is not filled as yet. So we just look at the purpose of asset management to establish the future needs arising from water and wastewater assets and recommend solutions through evidence derived strategy and I think the key word there is evidence. So the mission is to generate efficiency, value, trust through easy to understand, there's a key word again, evidence-based strategic decision-making. And really ultimately our objective here is to make decisions based in fact, rather than perception and to be data-driven and evidence-based. And I suppose other ones will be like Twitter pays and uh, ideas like that. So next slide, Andy. So under wastewater strategy, then we've got the network modeling team and that is led by Jane Crawford. We've got the strategic um, asset performance team and that's uh, led by Martin Cockey. Then we've got a data analyst who's just joined our team and that's Michelle Cassidy. Strategic planning then is led by Jason MacArthur and then environmental outcomes, which is really our thought here today, is led by both Orla and Andy, who are presenting here today. So Orla would look after the environmental outcomes in our Living With Water program, and Andy then looks after the rest of the country. So really the purpose of our team is to provide technical insight and plan strategic wastewater solutions and environmental outcomes. And again, just to stress that it is linked with to data, linked to evidence, and linking, linking to um, uh, yeah, data and evidence, sorry. Uh, outcomes. Okay, next slide. So our challenges. We've got many challenges going forward from environmental compliance to funding to COP26 was mentioned there earlier, climate change and net carbon zero to development constraints and growth and all of our stakeholder engagements and then data and then a key word is innovation. And one of the areas that we want to really push 
in the whole strategy side of wastewater is to look at things from a completely different perspective and looking at innovative ways to be able to deliver environmental compliance. Next slide, Andy. Okay, North Mountain Water has had a legacy of underfunding over many years. Uh, we can see here that PC15, you know, we received a lot less money than what our regulator had recommended uh, for us in PC15. Then PC15, uh, PC21, which has just commenced, uh, the regulator has recommended 2.2 billion pounds, and uh, we trust that that can be financed now through the Northern Ireland government, and that we can then help to uh, over uh, overcome the underfunding deficit that we've had over many years. If we are funded uh, fully, it will take us 12 years to address the legacy issues within wastewater in Northern Water. Next slide, Andy. Okay, this slide uh, points out the top left-hand uh, map shows us, uh, it's been nicknamed the measle map. <laughs> and uh, So it points out that we've got 100 economic constrained areas in Northern Ireland at the minute. These are areas, mainly towns and uh, cities that have got uh, local development constraints because of wastewater uh, infrastructure issues. And also during PC21, there will be other areas will be added to that list as well. So there's ongoing problems will be, will, will come, uh, will arise as we go through PC21. And then the bottom slide uh, shows you that uh, there is there is limited investment in PC21. It will take PC27 to deal with all of the development constraints that we have in, in Northern Arm Water. Next slide, Andy. So one of the big areas is uh, UIDs. And uh, I suppose most people in the, the, uh, the webinar will understand what the UID is and uh, UID is, and it's uh, designed to prevent flooding. So whenever there's a large storm flow, that that then is like a release valve and it allows it to go out into the local water course and also to protect public health. But a lot of these UIDs are unsatisfactory and they can cause pollution. And as we commence PC21, we estimate about 34% of our overflows in Northern Ireland water are considered to be unsatisfactory or substandard. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'll hand over to Orla. And maybe I should say that I really appreciate the help of Orla here because she's helped produce all of my slides here this evening. So thanks for doing that, Orla. And I'll pass on to you now to discuss some of the examples of work that we're doing within the team. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Paul. And uh, yeah, so uh, really as outlined by Paul there, Northern Ireland Water is facing a number of wastewater challenges that will certainly extend beyond PC21. And what I'd like to do is to take everyone through some of the programs of work that wastewater strategy are implementing in PC21 to help us plan for the future management of wastewater infrastructure, uh, in, in particular, like so forward to PC27. Um, and thank you, me, Paul. I would also like to thank my colleagues uh, in wastewater strategy who have provided me with a lot of these examples that I'm going to take you through tonight from each of their focus areas. So really, I'm just going to give a high level run through of some of the example programs within wastewater strategy. And then Andy is going to provide a more detailed focus on the uh, integrated environmental modeling program. I myself also sit in environmental outcomes and as mentioned at the start cover integrated working and the living with water program but uh, the living with water program is subject of another SIWEM technical talk in February I believe so I'm not going to cover anything in relation to that tonight I certainly wouldn't want to put any spoilers on for the next presentation and um, so Andy if you're okay to skip on to the next slide there so uh, Looking at the network modeling and want to sort of highlight two examples 
programs and that's our drainage area program and the enhanced drainage area studies. So sewer network models are key in helping us uh, understand the performance and capacity of our wastewater systems. And then in turn, we use the models to develop our long-term solutions. The drainage area program um, develops computerized representations of our foul combined and connected surface water systems, incorporating all their physical attributes, how deep, how big, uh, the condition of our assets, and includes key sources that input into them, likes of domestic and trade flows, runoff from roads and roofs and such. And by representing this data in the models, we can simulate how our networks perform. Um, for example, looking at the onset of flooding and understanding flooding mechanisms, um, helping us understand how often our overflows are operating and how much they discharge and then understanding the potential impacts of additional flows, say from new developments, or the impact from, say, for the likes of an asset failure, like a pumping station. Once we understand these risks and the mechanism that caused them, we're there in a much better place to develop solutions and to use the models to test those solutions. Next slide, Andy, please. So through uh, PC15, Northern Ireland Water invested extensively in sewer network modelling, and we are continuing this through PC21 with a programme of 73 further catchments. These are typically um, areas of over about 2,000 population, um, and we're programming a model modelling programme for these. This is also supported by a rural catchments model build programme, and we estimate that there will be about 112 rural areas within this program. And these would be typically catchments that are maybe just a couple of hundred in population. Um, and again, these models are all used to support our decision making. Uh, next slide, Andy, please. So the Northern Ireland draft flood risk management plan um, includes as a plan measure Northern Ireland water enhanced drainage area studies for the 12 identified areas of potential significant flood risk uh, across Northern Ireland and these are shown on the, the map there on the slide. And these are areas where pollution or surface water flooding along with other types of flooding are considered to be a significant risk. So these enhanced DAP models are um, augmentations of our drainage area models that include all of Northern Ireland water's surface water networks. And we can use these models then to support a greater understanding of outer sewer flooding risk, including that associated with surface water. Next slide, Andy, please. So moving on to strategic asset performance. Um, so as part of this, Northern Ireland Water is reviewing approaches to base maintenance planning, including sewer rehabilitation. Uh, Northern Ireland Water holds a lot of data and information on the condition of our infrastructure and many different parts of our business collect sewer condition information. So through PC21, we are looking uh, at rationalizing all this data from the various programs into a central location, such that we can leverage as much benefit as possible from the data. Work is also being undertaken to update our sewer rehabilitation methodologies and to link all the data spatially to our corporate GIS systems, making access by various users across the company much easier. Uh, next slide, Andy, please. Uh, so moving into strategic data, I think as some of my hopefully previous slides have alluded to, we hold a significant amount of data, be it from telemetry, flow, mon flow meters, model predictions, pump operations, and it is vital that we can leverage this information to support our understanding of our system of systems, optimize their operation and develop evidence-based solutions. Uh, with this in mind, the strategic data analyst stream has been set up within wastewater strategy, such to support the wider team. An example of this is uh, the event duration monitoring data or EDM data. Uh, these, mon these are monitors that are placed on our overflows and that record when and for how long an overflow operates. 
Um, pilots for the EDMs were initiated in PC15 and in PC21 we're rolling this out further. Therefore, it is absolutely vital that we have the supporting data analysis tools to maximize the benefits from the monitors, for example, in validation of our drainage area models or in identifying trends that may indicate deterioration in performance, for example, from rising silt level levels. Uh, it's also really important, given the amount of data that we potentially have and its complexity, that we can present this data um, and visualize it in a way that supports communication with both our internal and external uh, stakeholders. Developing better ways to present this complex information will certainly support easier decision making being based on clear evidence. Uh, thanks, Andy. Next one there, please. So a key focus in PC21 is wastewater reform and as set out in this slide, Northern Ireland Water, working with NIA as our key stakeholder, has set out a roadmap whereby Northern Ireland Water and NIA can work collaborative to meet the requirements for evolving regulation. The development of and um, the response to new compliance methodologies within a common data environment will ensure that there is a step change and improvement in the regulatory business as usual processes. And then, in, you know, in line with um, the draft river basin management plans, this will also support whole catchment approaches to planning and wastewater management, supporting integrated sustainable solutions that will ultimately deliver the desired water quality outcomes. Uh, next slide there, Andy, please. Okay, so, so far, uh, a lot of these, my programs have sort of maybe focused a bit on the collection system and such, so it's perhaps only right that I finish my section on disposal um, and specifically Northern Ireland Water's long-term sludge strategy. So at present, Northern Ireland Water incinerates approximately 175,000 tonnes of sludge every year at a centralised site in Belfast. However, this process requires a significant amount of energy and generates greenhouse gases. Um, in fact, we estimate that approximately 10% of our operational carbon is due to sludge incineration. A long-term strategy is currently being developed to prepare for major investment in PC27. Uh, and this strategy includes consideration of technologies that can help uh, tap the high energy potential of sewage sludge, um, which potentially is around 34,000 megawatt hours per annum, and that can deliver a carbon negative solution through use of renewable energy. Um, and that, that will also produce uh, organic and nutrient rich byproducts. As such, the process then becomes sustainable and environmentally beneficial. So really a key consideration in this strategy being uh, value recovery and net zero. Um, so uh, I appreciate that I have very much given a whistle stop tour of um, our wastewater strategy and some of the programs that we are currently looking at across the various pillars that make up wastewater strategy and hope it's been interesting. Um, so uh, I'm now pleased probably to hand over to Andy who can give a deeper dive on one particular program and that's the environmental modeling program under environmental outcomes. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Orla. Um, as Orla says, I'm gonna go into a bit of detail into one of the programme areas here, and it's integrated environmental modelling uh, and a programme of work going on uh, in PC15 and PC21. Uh, one of the common questions uh, we tend to get asked is what's the, the purpose of IEM, what is IEM, and what's the outcome of, of IEM? So hopefully as I go through the slide today, that should hopefully all become apparent. Um, so whenever we start out in the great environmental modeling project, we, we tend to look at what, what is the pollutants of concern? Is it, is it nitrogen, phosphorus, and bacteria? It can be a combination of all these uh, pollutants and, and other pollutants. We then undertake our modeling to, to understand what, what is the impact of, of these pollutants? Uh, are they causing eutrophication in freshwater or coastal environments? Are they depleting oxygen or rivers uh, and coastal environments? Uh, we're just really trying to get answers from the modeling uh, to enable us to then look at who who is impacting 
on the water quality in a particular area? Is it, is it a consequence of our direct and intermittent discharges, or is it potentially other sources of pollution within the catchment? So what we want to do is focus in on what we can do to improve the environment in order to enable us to do long-term wastewater planning. And a lot of the challenges that, that Paul had mentioned there all come into the mix here when we're considering uh, long-term wastewater planning. Um, we've got a lot of development constraints across the country, uh, urban growth and, and creep constraints. Um, we've got an old aging sewer network, uh, a lot of combined sewer networks still in operation uh, and, and a lot of infiltration within that network. We also have to consider climate change uh, in this and balancing act. Uh, and we've also got our internal sort of drivers to reduce energy uh, and net zero carbon ambitions, reduce chemicals and operational costs. And we all have to do this sort of in a cost effective and cost beneficial way. In terms of the areas then that we are, are currently looking at, um, by the end of PC21, we hope to have modeled the whole country. Uh, initially, we in PC15, we, we undertook a few assessments in the areas in blue. Uh, it was under the banner of the, the shellfish and bathing water remediation project or the, the Sabre project. Uh, and it covered uh, uh, shellfish waters and bathing waters uh, in Dundrum, Newcastle and Larne uh, modeling domains. Uh, sort of the, the next wave, if you like, of, of models was uh, that they were funded under the EU uh, SWELL project. That's the Shared Waters Enhancement and Locks Legacy project. Uh, and then Living With Water program uh, was uh, focusing on, on the, the Belfast model and the area and the greater lagging catchment. Uh, the next wave flag is the sort of waves that we're currently in, and that's looking at um, uh, bathing and shellfish waters uh, as well on the coast in Strangford and Cullock, and then uh, freshwater assessments in the main Moyola, Ballandaria, and Blackwater that, that feed into uh, our main freshwater body in Loch Ney. Uh, and then the yellow residual areas are, are areas that we're sort of prioritizing at the moment in order to get us towards a, an unconstrained wastewater bid for, for PC27 by about uh, year four of PC21. Uh, to enable us to do this, we have a, a wide range of monitoring infrastructure across the country. I'll go into it in a bit more detail in the next few slides. During PC15, the little blue icons are covering uh, most of the Sabre uh, shellfish and bathing water uh, domains. And we installed about 30 of those in PC15. But more recently, we have uh, currently got about 124 instrumentation across the, the green catchments. Uh, and we reckon that's going to grow to uh, probably well over 200 by the middle of PC21. Uh, these stations that we're installing are all self-powered. 90% um, of those are powered by solar power, uh, a small proportion are um, powered by wind power, and some are uh, actually powered by, um, by the water itself. Um, and within these stations, they're, they're measuring depth uh, as a default, but they're also a mixture of, of water quality sounds as well uh, within selected locations across the country. In terms of collecting quantity, um, sorry, sorry, click too many times there. Yeah, so in terms of taking quantity, we go out to the rivers and uh, we undertake the British standard method for, for gauging rivers. Um, we try and collect base flow conditions for those rivers and build up our own stage discharge relationships over time. Uh, we also undertake uh, data collection, bathymetry data and tidal current data within coastal environments as well uh, in order to build uh, sort of robustness into the models. We also go out during wet weather events. These are high risk events, a uh, lot of health and safety requirements required to undertake these events, but these, these events actually make or break the model. These are the events that actually uh, give us model confidence. Uh, and we go out and we, we try to measure the, the discharge and, and measure the, the concentrations of these rivers over 24 to 36 hour um, periods. And the sort of bottom video was uh, an event in Newcastle in August 2020. It was quite a high profile event here locally. It was uh, a lot of flooding locally. You can see all the debris collected up by the bridge. Um, we actually lost an auto sampler in that event. Um, so it was, it was quite exceptional, that one. In terms of the quality data collection, I've just picked a sort of random event from a random kiosk here. Um, the blue line is um, the, the quantity coming from CSOs. Uh, you can see there there's a small spill 
and then the orange line is the, the receiving uh, water that it goes into. So there's sort of a factor of 10, if you like, dilution, looking at the peak discharge, in terms of the, the quantity, there's, there's probably a lot more quantity coming through the, the stream discharge. Um, we then start to collect dissolved oxygen and BOD information uh, downstream of this discharge. Uh, you can sort of see that the initial spill caused a, a bit of a spike in, in the BOD and the receiving water, and then it sort of tailed off. And then the, the, the stream discharge uh, appears to cause a long duration uh, DO sag in that river. And it didn't reach any WFD thresholds, but uh, I suppose the, the information that we are gleaning from this information will enable us to sort of do discharge assessments in house in real time, uh, creating sort of asset and environmental digital twins so that we can actually prioritize and target investment based on real data that we're witnessing through our, our, our network of sensors. Um, in terms of like looking at assets, we're undertaking a lot of sort of innovation work in this field. Um, we put CCTV cameras down CSO overflows. We, we monitor the quantity of CSO overflows and we also uh, look at trade effluent discharges and monitor the quality of trade effluent discharges as some of those can actually have a, a larger impact on, on receiving waters uh, as and when they escape CSOs. And we're also taking a number of uh, current long-term trials looking at non-contact flow measurement within sewer networks to build up better model confidence in our drainage area models so that we can then have better confidence in our environmental impact assessments when we look at scenario planning with, with all the models. Um, the key sort of what, what we're doing as well is, is the, the duration monitoring program. Um, this is the current kind of spatial distribution across Northern Ireland of, of our EDM network. Um, the red sites are sort of in progress, if you like. Uh, the, the orange sites are installed, but not live. And the green ones are the, the live sites. Um, and most of them are targeted around uh, our sort of bathing and shelf fresh waters um, initially and that, that, that network will grow during PC21. And all this information and data that we're collecting is feeding into another project, an internal digital twin uh, project. So all the, the information I just mentioned there previously about our environmental and asset water quantity and quality data all has to be contextualized with climate data. So we need to bring rainfall in to look at dry weather periods and look at wet weather periods. We also want to bring in the cost to serve data. So we want to look at the the operational costs uh, of our wastewater treatment works, the operational costs of our pumping stations, uh, and look at what impact the asset health performance of, say, a pumping station is, is having on the environmental impact, but also on its cost to serve. So then we can actually look at this in real time and actually intervene at these assets and, and optimize the solutions, target investigations around these areas so we can target uh, investment prioritization as well. Uh, so sort of there's seven key stages of like of an IEM project. Uh, the first stage is, is scoping. So we would go in and we would look at what what's the drivers in this catchment. Is it is it designated bathing or shellfish water? Is, is it a freshwater assessment? What, what are the main uh, drivers for concern uh, in those areas? We then undertake a series of surveys of the rivers and our assets um, to, to understand what is the gap analysis, what data would we need to collect uh, as part of the study. Parallel to this, then we, we put in a real time monitoring network. Uh, and then we move into the data collection phase where we'd undertake the, 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 the river stream measurements, uh, asset overflow measurements, uh, and also a series of samples. There'd be over 20,000 samples collected during PC21 uh, as part of the program. And all this then goes into our models to give us a better understanding of what's happening in the environment. Uh, and so then we can start to undertake compliance assessments. Um, this looks at the current condition of the environment, looks at nutrients and public health risks of bacteria. I'll, I'll look at dissolved oxygen as well. So we can then move into the optioneering phase where we undertake cost effectiveness analysis. So we're, we're looking at our impact alongside the sources of other pollution and trying to come up with the best environmental outcome for a particular hydrological area. Uh, so in parallel with this baseline assessment, and optioneering fees, we have early contractor involvement with our delivery teams. We're also looking at the buildability of our solutions. We're running that through series of models. We're preparing the business cases, all in preparation for a cost benefit analysis um, at, at the end of the process. Um, 
So in terms of the individual pollution sources that we, we model, um, I've mentioned in, in a lot of detail about our continuous intermittent discharges. We also model the, the runoff from uh, diffuse pollution, and we also model the septic tank network. And there's also a series of small uh, agglomerations throughout the country where we don't have a drainage area model, and very small areas where we actually stick this all into the, the mix to help us calibrate the model. And we use a series of tools. We have an in-house asset discharge model that basically converts the quantity to, to quality to create pollutographs that then go into subsequent river models and, and coastal models to create our compliance assessment where we're, we, we, we basically are looking at pie charts. Uh, we're looking at what is our, our slice of the pie, if you like, towards that particular pollutant parameter that, that's of interest. Uh, we can then hone in on an individual town or city and we can say, right, well, we know that's causing a particular component or proportion, should I say, of the pollution and which of the assets should we target within that catchment in order to remediate the water quality. Uh, one of the key studies we have here is uh, from Dundrum. This is our, our first study that, that produced a compliance assessment. Um, this is the bay here. It's a, it's a, it's a tidal embayment and it drains twice a day. Um, I'm actually looking south here in this photo, so the more mountains here at the top, and uh, there's a small village, uh, Dundrum village here, and there's another large town, Ansborough, uh, coming in one of the, the four rivers that, that drain into this bay. As you can see from the picture, it's quite a, an agricultural area uh, in the catchment surrounding it. And uh, the, the, the main driver uh, at this stage was uh, the shellfish water protected area status of this bay, the, the inner south part of the bay was bottom culture mussels, and then the north part of the bay was um, oysters uh, on trestles. It was also designated as a sensitive area as well for um, uh, winter nutrients. So I'm just gonna focus here on the bacterial compliance assessment. Um, within the bay at all little green dots, we were able to extract the sources of pollution uh, over a 10 year simulation of historical rainfall. Um, we didn't want to look at all those pie charts, so we decided just to hone in on a couple um, that were in the, the inner north, shellfish water, uh, sorry, uh, licensed bed, and the inner south, uh, licensed bed. Uh, and essentially, uh, when you look at the inner north part of the bay, um, our assets were contributing 40% of the bacterial pollution. And if you look at the inner south, uh, it was three quarters of the bacterial pollution within the bay. Um, and there was uh, still a, a, a good proportion of other sources of pollution um, within the bay to be addressed to remediate the water quality. So that led us to look at catchment-based outcomes, uh, realizing that we, we couldn't do this uh, in isolation. Uh, so we committed to some scenarios within some of the smaller towns within uh, the catchment, at Dundrum uh, and Clock. And then our large town within the catchment was Ansborough, which suffers from sort of real chronic winter infiltration problems. Uh, so we were looking at a, a range of uh, hard solutions uh, and soft solutions, uh, removing of the infiltration and uh, ingress within that network to try and come with a balance between what is getting out intermittently and the treatment load that's going through the wastewater treatment works. So that process is, is kind of ongoing at the moment. Um, even if we were to test the model, we tested the model with a, like a zero spill solution, it still didn't get us to the water quality target. So this is where the sort of diffuse scenario track in came in, uh, in combination with the nutrient pressures in the catchment that we had to look at uh, measures within the, the wider catchment uh, and two of the rivers to reduce the, the runoff uh, coming into the inner base system. We're looking forward then using our EDM program. Uh, we're looking towards uh, measures such as the, the SOAF, the Storm Overflow Assessment Framework. Um, I'm sure a lot of people in the webinar will be familiar with this. Um, the first stage of this is uh, ask the questions is, is the asset spilling a lot, which is spilling a lot, which will be based on uh, mainly our, our EDM uh, where available. Um, the next stage asks is why is that asset spilling a lot? And um, there's derogations in there for exceptional weather and, and operational issues. And then sort of where, where we would come in is if it's due to hydraulic incapacity, 
what, what is the impact of this overflow? Um, so there's a series of measures there looking at the local aesthetics of the, the overflow, uh, vertebrate kick sampling, and then ultimately a staged approach to, to water quality modeling. And inevitably, this just goes through the process. I've, I've just, um, just displayed in, in Dundrum, it looks at an options assessment and cost benefit analysis, and then deliver the, the most cost beneficial solution at, at the end. Uh, one of the strategies we're looking at uh, is uh, the power of hindsight in the sort of early 90s, uh, in that period when electricity costs were, were quite cheap. Um, we had a lot of small villages that were pumped into to larger towns. Uh, and we're looking back at this policy and looking to run some scenarios through the model to say that uh, this is causing, maybe leading to some of the development constraints that we're having in some of our, our large towns. And can we ease some of that development constraints by, by treating at source? Um, there's septicity risks as well with pumping some of these wee small uh, pumping stations into to larger towns. And it's starting to cause a lot of increased hydraulic burden, if you like, in our, our terminal pumping stations and our wastewater treatment work storm tanks. Uh, and only it's increasing our, our energy and, and carbon footprint. A lot of hurdles to get over obviously in this approach um, there's obviously an increased operational compliance risk and environmental risk that we have to consider uh, um, and not only the, the business case as well we have to look at the business case that we're using whether it's going to capture the benefits uh, for example like monetizing carbon and also the benefits that uh, easing development constraints and um, increasing sort of economic productivity of the, these towns would have on the wider society all have to be brought into the, the question uh, and also land as well some of these solutions when we're looking at some of the nature-based solutions have have large land uptake um, so uh, it'll have to be all considered whether we can actually achieve a lot of these things uh, and the models can at least then give us the potential to run these scenarios and look at these things so uh, say there's a series of smaller ones from willow type solutions to, to wetlands for sort of small to medium-sized works there's a few RBC works that we've done that have been powered by solar energy and then sort of getting up to your sort of medium sized works. So you would, uh, we're looking at some aero fact technologies and uh, rotating filters as a well established type technology. Um, I suppose the solution will be fit for the site. I suppose we'll, we'll strive to be uh, nature based where, where possible, uh, but ultimately they have to be low energy, low carbon, uh, low maintenance and, and low in chemicals. said before the, the potential benefits here is, is freeing up the development constraints um this is if we start to get to the the main points and the network where it gets towards our wastewater treatment works and our terminal pumping station and our terminal cso's um it gives us time essentially to come up with a long-term plan to rectify the, the chronic infiltration and storm problems that we, we have in in all our networks across the uk um, can lower the frequency and the impact of UADs, um, potentially enhance the environment, but ultimately it can allow potentially headroom or wastewater treatment works and increase the capacity in some of the large towns. In terms of maximizing further environmental initiatives, we're, we're looking at our whole asset base, uh, our wastewater treatment works and our networks. Uh, we're screening them all with the water courses, looking at the, the types of, of water courses and their, their, their current water framework directive status. Uh, and we're giving consideration to alternative discharge regimes, ensuring that there's no harm or deterioration in the environment. Also with this global ambition to sort of lower our energy demand and carbon emissions. And just finally then, uh, just a bit of a, a note on the, the Environment Bill. It's been well uh, sort of publicised in, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's kind of going through the final stages um, through the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Um, it's yet to get royal sent. There's a bit of ping pong going on between the two houses at the moment. Um, there's specific provisions in here which uh, are applicable to ANI, um, but there are implications on the, uh, the Brexit agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, and the role of existing legislation and the European Court of Justice. So uh, we're just keeping a close eye on that one and just seeing how that may impact us here locally uh, over the next few months. Uh, but some of the key points there to, to pull out of it uh, are there's going to be a duty to publish storm overflow data and real-time operation of CSOs. 
and also to monitor water quality upstream and downstream of CSOs and the wastewater treatment work and the duty to create long-term sort of management plans for sewerage networks. So we're, uh, I think that we're pretty well planned for the future in that regard, if this does become legislation here locally. Thank you very much, that's, that's me. Okay, thanks very much, Paul, Orla, and Andy. Uh, I think everybody will agree that it was really well put together and a formative presentation. Uh, and it's good to see all the different programs and strategies that NA Water are, are using. Um, and as, as a bit of a Power BI gig, I was I was I liked Paul's visa map. Uh, I thought that was very good. So uh, we'll quickly move on to the Q and A session. And Orla is going to give us a, a wee bit of a hand here. Um, and it gives uh, you all a chance to, to ask a few questions in the Q&A. Um, I think I'll kick off the Q&A myself with a, a question for Andy uh, or Paul. Uh, so I suppose my question is, uh, what do you think are the main risks, uh, both current and future, uh, in this wastewater strategy? I'm not sure, Paul, do you want to join us on or? Hi. Uh... <laughs> Robert, that's a, that's a difficult question. Um, you know, there's, there's a funding risk. Uh, and uh, I, I would say funding is probably our biggest risk in terms of, I think we know exactly what needs to be done. Uh, it's just actually getting it done and getting the finances to actually carry that out. Don't know, Andy, if you've any other thoughts. Yeah, um, I suppose here in, uh, in Northern Ireland, we're in that unique situation with the the legislation and we're not quite sure what's going to happen in that regard so there's a bit of uncertainty about what we're we're, we're measuring against at this point in time and whether that's going to change in, in the very near future um, there's also the risk of climate change and um, there's various climate change scenarios that we will we will run through models and scenarios and um, it's it's very hard to decide which of those scenarios and which we should invest on, um, you know, because we, we've been looking at scenarios where it gets wet globally or it gets drier or the rivers got less dilution in them. And it's very hard to, to make a decision on which of those sort of um, approaches that we should invest in. I'm not sure, Arla, if you've anything else on that one. Yeah, so obviously climate, in, in terms of the, the climate change there that you were mentioning, it is obviously there is a great deal of variability and our impacts on that because I noticed there was also a question on climate change in the, the book the book about how we're we're looking at it. So you know we do have that issues where we have increased wetness um, in winter and what that means for our wastewater capacity with increased flows and then as you say the, the summer dryness and what that means within rivers and also within our own wastewater network systems um, where we're getting increasing potential concentrations and flows and such so yeah okay thank you um or do, do you see any questions there's, there's two questions yeah there. so there was one there if i think could not to not to give them all to you andy but sure why not <laughs> so uh, and i know this is one we have talked about so i can give it to you sort of how important is long-term verification uh, of urban wastewater models in achieving uh, the right sustainable solutions yeah it's very very important i suppose um I suppose that's why we're doing quite a lot of work in, in this area to, to do the long-term verification of the model, to build model confidence so that we can ensure that we're getting our environmental impact right. Uh, so that then we know that the solution that we build on the back end of that is, is resilient, if you like, to, to the future needs. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important. Uh, something that we're taking quite seriously. Okay, uh, we've got uh, another question here from Jenny Seymour. So uh, Jenny says, in England, we are awaiting the government's stormwater, uh, storm overflow plan, on whether it will focus on reducing the number of CSO spills or har harm from spills. Water quality monitor monitoring is key for the environmental harm case. What are some of the difficulties or barriers, if any, we have faced in providing timely, reliable water quality evidence, for example, that sewage is sufficiently diluted in storm events. Okay, do we take that one, Orla, as well? Yeah, you know uh, yeah so um, obviously water quality sounds are, are quite expensive. Um, I think the challenge for the, the industry, we're quite a small country. Um, 
we would find quite a cost effective way to, to roll this program out uh, across the province. Um, it might not be as easy as that in, in other parts of the, of the UK. Uh, I suppose the main thing I think that all the water companies are asking is what parameters are we are we monitoring? You know, we've we've made an assumption in terms of intermittent discharges. There's some parameters that can't be effectively remotely parametered. We always still have to sample uh, and model for. And uh, so that is some of the difficulties, you know, we, we until the technology catches up, um, we won't be able to monitor everything remotely, but we'll be able to at least look for indicators of stress within receiving waters to, to target areas of investigation, if you like, uh, in our business panel. Yeah. Um, as you say, I think there is, as well, I probably add, you know, we have, um, through our programs at the moment, obviously tried to do and have successfully done on occasions reactive sampling to rainfall where we are out at rivers and at CSOs um, monitoring them over a, um, either a 12 hour or a 24 hour period collecting samples at regular intervals to try and understand that relationship and what the, the condition and the environment is. Those are obviously challenges in terms of their resource intensive um, and often very difficult to predict and arrange because again, you're relying on, uh, you know, the rainfall and will CSOs operate and things like that. So there, there is a lot of um, logistical challenges in getting a lot of the base data um, to be able to look at uh, some of that. Okay, um, I see uh, uh, another question. And um, there's one here, which I'll, probably, I'll give to myself instead of giving to everybody else, maybe. So that's in formulating a strategy. Have you considered the drainage strategy from off what, or is there an equivalent guidelines uh, framework um, that you're able to follow? I'm assuming does that potentially mean the drainage and wastewater management plan framework? Um, if it does, um, uh, Northern Ireland Water is looking at, we have included as part of our PC21, um, developing our a, a drainage and wastewater management plan, and we're looking at those processes now. Uh, Northern Ireland Water um, is members of the implementation groups and steering groups for uh, drainage and wastewater management planning, and are certainly, um, although we're slightly behind, than where they are across uh, the water. Um, yes, we're looking to follow drainage and wastewater management planning processes that will help us set our plan for our next price control period in PC27. Um, I hope that was what you meant. Um, so um, just having a look through other questions. Um, there's, there's one there from Peter's maybe the contentious, but we'll read it out anyway. So will the automatic, mo automated monitoring systems be likely to include uh, small local wastewater treatment works associated with current and future private housing developments? Well, sure, Paul, do you want to take that one or? Yeah, well, look, um, I'm actually not too sure just uh, how, you know, because we're only, there's only so many EDMs that we're going to be doing in PC21. And uh, but as, as I think as Andy says, we will be following what the recommendations are coming through in legislation and making that data available. So I just I don't know whether I'll I will definitely will cover every town and every place where we have got uh, development constraints. Andy, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, just in terms of instrumentation network, it's obviously prioritised on the the bigger areas or the areas where we know we may have problems or we. We may be looking at an investment need or an operational need. Um, they're targeted there first. So I would imagine uh, this fee is a term PC21. That wouldn't be something that would be sort of high up our agenda. And we certainly wouldn't be funded for. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, Andy, I can probably provide a, another question here. It, it's in the, the comments box rather than the Q&A box, but I think I'll carry across so briefly. How is uh, agricultural contribution estimated in the model? This can make significant contribution to the overall pollution load. Um, is it checked on the ground, i.e. if significant livestock in the area? 
Yes, yeah, so all the models are populated mm -hmm. with, uh, if you like, the topology, the um, the runoff from uh, and livestock densities are applied to that. And that's when we go to the rivers mm -hmm. to measure the peak quantities and uh, peak concentrations in those rivers. They're used to calibrate the, the inputs at that point. And that's why it, it's key to get the sewer network models um, extremely accurate mm -hmm. so that then we can get the, the proportion of the source apportionment mm -hmm. rate to ensure that whenever we go to develop the solution that uh, we, are, we are putting an investment to the correct mm -hmm. proportion to the problem that we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another question here. Um, have you started the decentralization or are you just looking at options at the moment? Uh, yeah, we're, we've just looking at options. It's just scenarios at this point in time. We haven't actually decentralized any catchments as yet. Um, it's, it's just a scenarios that we're looking at through various models. Um, I think there's a question mm -hmm. there, which perhaps writes on this, where it says mm -hmm. there's conflicting views on the strategy with one slide talking about centralized sludge, sludge strategy, mm -hmm. strategies at a central location, but other slides talking about decentralization. Um, I don't know, Paul, if you want to, to answer that. Yeah. Maybe I'll just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, just come in on that, Orla. And I think, uh, as Andy says, <clears throat> we're looking at de decentralization as just options that we're considering. It may not be the best solution uh, for every uh, for every location, but decentralization is definitely part of a low carbon economy that you decentralize. Uh, so I, I think that's definitely something that we want to consider. Where it comes to our sludge strategy, because we're building really big assets, possibly like anaerobic digestion, the business case is telling you that the lowest carbon and uh, footprint and tool tech solution is to go for one large anaerobic digester rather than having a number of them around the, the countryside. So it just depends on how the business case stacks up. Okay, here's a, here's one. Um, does this wastewater strategy have any overlaps with the NA water clean water strategy? Mm hmm. I could say on that one, Paul, I can't talk too much. And in terms of uh, our IEM, we are undertaking sort of parallel projects with the clean water team, looking at mm -hmm. size reduction uh, for clean water, raw water intakes. Um, so in terms of that, there are some parallels, but Paul probably maybe know a bit more. Yeah, and uh, like I don't know all the detail, and we are trying to uh, bring the two strategies together. So the, the wastewater strategy and also then what uh, Thomas Gardner is doing on the, the clean water side. So in terms of net carbon zero, in terms of all of those key strategies that the company has, we will be uh, bringing them together. But I'm not too sure there's, if the question has got me, or the questioner has got some other things in their mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably have one more here uh, that I could uh, direct it your way. Um, that is considering the vast amount of instrumentation in both ADM and IEM programs being installed across the province, is there concern with regard to the maintaining of all the instrumentation and ensuring the data integrity over time? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Um, you know, you stick things in uh, under sewer manholes mm -hmm. and also in remote locations across the country, uh, it does create uh, a logistical challenge. Uh, we have a team that just go around the country actually calibrating all our sensors every two weeks. Um, so we kind of know the, the, the cost of maintaining that. Uh, time will tell what the replacement costs are on these. So we obviously get a lot of promises from suppliers, but um, time will tell, I suppose, what the, the whole life cost is on our sort of IEM instrumentation program. But I think that the cost outweighs the benefit to the business, mm. considering uh, the small proportion of that cost relative to uh, appraisal costs and investment appraisal costs. Um, it's, it's a small price to play. Okay, thanks, Andre. Uh, I think we'll take one more question. Um, 
uh, and maybe one that's on the, the news uh, recently. So opinions on raw sewage being pumped out into rivers and seas uh, as seen throughout England and Wales recently. We'll pass that one to Paul, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, look, uh, I think that uh, pumping raw sewage out into rivers is, is a no-no. That's not, we don't want to do that. And, you know, I suppose any of the EIDs we have, it's happening during, you know, heavy rainfall. So it's dilute. But for to to pump raw sewage out into the uh, uh, water courses, that's something we want we don't want to be doing in the future. OK, thanks. Uh, I think we'll bring the webinar to a close there. Uh, I'm sure everyone will agree it was a stimulating uh, presentation and Q&A. So thank you to, again to all the panellists, uh, Paul, Andy and Orla, uh, for all the work we put in. Uh, and thank you to Jane and SciWim Head Office for facilitating this webinar. And also thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Uh, so with that being said, thank you all for listening. Enjoy the rest of your evening. I uh, hope to see you all again at the next webinar, which again is next Thursday lunchtime. Uh, so thank you all and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.